And I am very pleased to be welcoming Dr. Neil Jetton, the Director of Cybercrime at Interpol, uh, joining us here at the Cypher Brief. Dr. Jetton, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me and thank you for uh, allowing you know me to discuss Interpol and the Cybercrime Directorate. Of course, absolutely. I'm really interested, you know, there have been a number of press releases uh, lately about some of the arrests that have been made with phishing scams and other things. But overall, I'm just very interested in, in knowing how you're seeing technology in particular feed cybercrime. Yeah, so obviously cyber, you know, just the name itself indicates that it's a computer. But so computers and computer crimes have been around for a long time. But you can see that anytime we have some sort of emerging technology, whether it's artificial intelligence or in the future, I think it's going to be quantum computing. You can see that, you know, the uh, the criminals are going to take advantage and take advantage of any loopholes, exploit it for their own purposes. I think by and large, the technology is agnostic. Uh, it's just who who uses it and for what purpose really determines whether it's for good, you know, or uh, or for criminality. But it does affect how we train and uh, and our ongoing future projects. Yeah. I, I think artificial intelligence, as you mentioned, is a fascinating one because it's making a lot of things easier, both for those fighting crime and those perpetrating crime. How are you sure. thinking about, and I realize you've been at Interpol just a couple of months now, but how are you thinking right. about AI, how AI is going to impact both your ability to fight cybercrime, but also um, people's ability to conduct more crime using AI? So, yeah, so we'll start with the, with the bad guys first. I mean, using it, obviously, with the deep fakes, they can now go into a, and, and make an email seem very realistic. Where in the past, maybe like for a phishing uh, email, it might not have, it may have, you know, set off some alarm bells. But now they're using, you know, ChatGPT or some other AI system, and it, it makes it sound, you know, authentic. So yeah, it's going to be very, very tough. But I do think at the same time that law enforcement can access it as well. I mean, we do, we should use the ability for AI to take large data sets and then be able to analyze that uh, to our advantage as well. I mean, I, they are doing threat mapping in certain areas, which we were able to do quickly now uh, with AI, where in the past it would take, you know, take a long time. Uh, let me ask you, I know there were some uh, headlines as well about business email compromises, and that's kind of a, a new thing and really looks, as you mentioned, I mean, these phishing scams are getting a lot more sophisticated, really right. looks real. What advice do you have for potential victims of scams like this to protect themselves? Because it's not just about you know, looking for misspellings anymore. Right, it is not. I think it's 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 getting much more difficult. So whether it's a romance scam, whether it's a phishing scam that uses you know some sort of business contact, I think they're becoming much more much more sophisticated. I think you have to ask yourself, unfortunately, every every time, hey, is this a uh, is this a phishing scam? Um, you know, why would somebody out of the blue send me an investment opportunity about cryptocurrency, for example? Um, so you really, really have to be diligent about that. I think, you know, businesses should, and I'm not telling businesses what to do, but one thing that they could do is they could set up their own phishing, you know, um, tests. So they send out an email to their employees and just as, as a form of like education and, you know, cause they're, they're very, very realistic. Um, and you think, oh no, I'm not, I'm not going to be victimized by this. And yet we're all human. We're all curious, you know, uh, that's part of both our strength and weaknesses. So, yeah, I think just being really diligent about it and just putting out the messaging and Interpol does that with public awareness campaigns to say, hey, these business email compromise schemes, these long term investment schemes, these are real and they're going to prey on your, you know, your curiosity, your kindness uh, uh, through through typically through emails or through texts. Yeah. And now it's a scary environment because we're putting voluntarily so much personal information about ourselves out there for people to kind of collect and say, what would they most be likely to click on? Let me ask you, how right. are you working with international partners and in particularly, how are you working with the private sector? Yeah, so the biggest I think the biggest reason that Interpol is successful is through our ability to make to have partnerships. So. Interpol just, you know, by the organization has 196 member countries. That means we have 196 different law enforcement touch points that uh, we're able to connect with. But it goes beyond law enforcement. There's no one size fits all strategy to combat cyber crime. It's going to require, as you mentioned, private sector partners. It's going to require strategists, policymakers, uh, national security agencies, as well as law enforcement to combine. So within the Interpol Cybercrime Dir Directorate, Directorate, we have a very um, successful uh, gateway partnership where we have vetted partners 
that provide us usually intelligence that we will then look at, vet, and then send to law enforcement agencies that require it. And sometimes it works the, in the reverse. Law enforcement agencies will reach out to us and say, hey, do you have information on this specific ransomware group? And we'll go to that our intel partners and say, do you have do you have any information? And then we'll feed that back to law enforcement. So without a doubt, the, the partnership piece is how we are successful. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you two really hard questions. The first one is, especially sure. being new to the role, um, what is your biggest challenge right now in this job? You know, I think it's like anything else. Um, I, well, I think it's not knowing what you don't know. I'll say that of just about Interpol, about anywhere else. But I think that, you know, funding, personnel, those are pieces, those are going to be problems, you know, for, for not just Interpol, but for other organizations. So it's just trying to find that funding piece so that we can continue to sustain the projects that we have ongoing. Yeah. What about biggest opportunity? Uh, what is the, the mark that you would really like to make during your tenure here? And what do you think requires the most attention right now? Yeah, so I think the way that Interpol works, the way that our directorate works is we approach things through a regional, a regional approach. So we have 196 member countries and that's too many countries for our personnel to actually go in and say what each country does and give them a, you know, specific tailored assistance. It's just a little bit overwhelming. So what we've done is take a regional approach and currently we're focused on the Africa region and Asia and South Pacific. So we have funding for those different projects. So we're able to provide support from Singapore, which is where the Cybercrime Directorate is based. And then we are able to um, fund seconded officers from that region who actually work on the ground. And they're the, they're the ones who know what the threats are. And then throughout the year, we're able to provide them intelligence, provide them operational support to have some very uh, impactful uh, operations. In fact, just this September, we, we began op uh, Operation Surge 3.0 in Africa. And as of last Friday, so in three weeks time roughly, we've had several hundred arrests. So it's a very significant um, operation for us. You're joining the Cypher Brief now from Dubai. What's been the topic of conversation there for you? I think it's just how we can continue the partnership with Interpol and how can Interpol, uh, you know, be a good partner with the private sector, with the national cybersecurity agencies. It's how we can all link up. I mean, we all have the same, I think, goal in sight, and that's to combat cybercrime and make this world a more cyber secure uh, place. It's just how do we get there? And I think Interpol has a, a very important critical role to play, and it's with our with the partners here in Dubai, uh, you know, in Riyadh, uh, across our 196 member countries. Yeah. Um, what is the one question that people have asked you uh, since you've been in Dubai that uh, you feel like is sort of really putting a finger on a trend right now or concerns among the people who you talk to? Yeah, they're always asking what the biggest cybercrime trend that we see is. And so uh, typically, as I mentioned, there's I would say that among all the different scams that we see, the biggest trend that we that we're witnessing um, obviously, it's ransomware. You can see the, the growth of that, but as well as kind of more simplistic uh, scams as far as business email compromises, romance scams, and how do we combat those issues? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you've got your work cut out for you, Dr. Neil Jetton, uh, Director of Cyberprime at Interpol. We want to thank you so much for taking a few minutes yeah. uh, to talk with us here at the Cyber Brief. Thank you. No, no thank you. I appreciate it.